فائز فتقوى بواو نظل إن فائز فثواب ويوار جائز فجنة بكار نق paradise حائز فحج the blessed pilgrimage خائز فخاتم the seal of the prophethood given to the prophet محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم Assalamu alaikum. I'm Zafar Bangash. Welcome to Ramadan Journey, a program that looks at the various dimensions of the month of Ramadan. Ramadan, the month of fasting, is linked with a number of important events in early Islamic history, uh, the most well-known of which, or the most important of which, of course, is the revelation or the first few ayats of the revelation of the Noble Quran, to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the solitude of the cave of Hira. Ramadan also, of course, is linked with developing our taqwa. And it is something that we really need to understand uh, in a much broader sense than simply this um, inadequate expression that is used for taqwa as piety. Taqwa is a lot more than that. And this is what we have been talking about in these series of programs. Of course, Ramadan also is the month in which the Battle of Badr took place when the early Muslims were tested, and uh, the liberation of Mecca also occurred uh, in the month of Ramadan. To help us understand these and other issues, uh, we have once again Imam Muhammad al-Asi, who is a fellow at the Institute of Contemporary Islamic Thought. He's a scholar and author of many books, uh, the most well-known of which, of course, is uh, his monumental tafsir, The Ascendant Quran, Realigning Man to the Divine Power Culture. Six volumes of this tafsir have already been published. The seventh is almost complete, and other volumes will, inshallah, be ready very soon. And we once again turn to Imam Muhammad al-Asi to help us understand some of the concepts that have been addressed in the Noble Quran. Imam Muhammad Al-Asi, welcome to the program once again. Thanks. Now, in the Quran, uh, we find uh, these two terms um, used uh, frequently, but in different contexts. One is Muslim, and the other is Mu'min. What's the difference between these two? Well... The word Muslim simply refers to a person who, in the civil sense of the word, has entered into the fold of Islam. What does that mean, civil sense of the word? It means that uh, as far as society is concerned, that person uh, belongs to a society that calls itself Islamic. Uh, it is a, uh, a designation that is not religious. That's why I said the word civil. It is not per se, as has been the case with the Muslim mind for so long. When someone says Muslim, all of a sudden this religious designation is placed on that person. It's not a religious designation that should be, uh, should be placed on that person person confessing Islam. It is, it is a civil designation. There's an area I think maybe that would probably explain this a little more for those who are tuned in. The area says, وَقَالَتِ الْأَعْرَابُ آمَنَّا قُلْ لَمْ تُؤْمِنُوا وَلَكِنْ قُولُوا أَسْلَمْنَا The Arabians, uh, the nomadic Arabic speaking speakers said, but we are, we have committed ourselves to Allah. We have become mu'mins. The response to that was, say to them, you have not committed yourselves. You have rather become Muslims, which means you have now joined an Islamic civil society or an Islamic civic order. 
That's the extent of it. Iman is a, a, a degree further than that. Iman is a position in which a Muslim commits himself by, by deed uh, to carry the responsibilities that are ingrained uh, in scripture and that were demonstrated by the Prophet. So if um, we look at this definition of a Muslim, if let's say a non-Muslim were residing in a Muslim society or an Islamic society, um, and he were not hostile to this Islamic order in society, in the civic sense that non-Muslim would be considered a Muslim? That's right. He'd have an Islamic citizenship. Right. Even though religiously he is not a Muslim. I see. He'd have an Islamic citizenship. Uh, there's uh, there's a, a clarification that has to be made with the issue of Iman and Mu'min and Mu'minin and all of this. The translations that are used use the word believer. And that is not a word that should, I th in my opinion, should never be used in translating this word and its derivatives uh, into the English language. And perhaps it might help our viewers if you were to explain the um, the root words of the word mu'min uh, because the Arabic language is, is a very sophisticated language. The little that I know that there, it has root words and you derive words from that and that help you to understand the, the proper meanings of, of the terms. Yes, the, the, the word mu'min or iman is a convergence of uh, two strains of characters. One of them is uh, trustworthiness and uh, carrying um, a responsibility. Uh, a hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alihi wa Sallam says, Man la amanata lah, la iman lah. Whoever uh, does not carry a trust, the amana, the amana does not have any iman. And what does that trust mean? Well, the, there's another ayah in the Quran. This is the beauty of the Quran. Some ayat are an explanation to other ayat. Allah says, Allah subhanahu wa says in another ayah, إِنَّا عَرَضْنَا الْأَمَانَةَ عَلَى السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَالْجِبَالِ فَأَبَيْنَا أَنْ يَحْمِلْنَهَا وَأَشْفَقْنَا مِنْهَا وَحَمَلَهَا الْإِنسَانِ We have um, uh, offered this amana to the heavens and the earth and the mountains to carry it. But they refused to do so. And they stood in awe of this responsibility. It was, it's a tremendous responsibility. They are not able to do that. But Al-Insan, the social being that you and I and all of us are, we assume that responsibility. We carry this responsibility, this amana, this trust. This trust translates into a responsibility. So this is one of the strains that goes into defining who a mu'min is. The fact that he is consciously uh, moving forward with this trust and responsibility in life. The other uh, aspect of uh, Iman is Amn. Ula'ika lahumul Amn. The ayah says in the Quran. Amn simply means secure, confidence and security. So if we blend in these two, the trust and responsibility, with confidence and security, we have a mu'min. We have a ladina amanu. We have al-mu'mineen. And we have these ayat. That's why in the Quran many times you see, Ya ayyuha ladina amanu. And then after that you see there's a task that's going to, that's expected to be performed. Never will you, will you see in the Quran, Ya ayyuha ladina aslamu. Or ayyuhal muslimoon. Or these, no, it doesn't speak to them. 
it, to break it down so that an average person can understand it much better, Islam is like elementary school. You enter elementary school and you are a Muslim, you are initiated into a new set of uh, responsibilities. But in order for you to understand these right responsibilities more and to carry them out to their extent, you go on to the university. In, in this sense, you are a mu'min. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, stop you there. We want to continue with this. Uh, and to our viewers, um, you know, we are really getting into very detailed uh, understandings and explanations of some very, very important concepts in the Quran. And in fact, in the Quran, uh, when uh, Ramadan was made compulsory, it was addressed to the mu'mineen. It was not addressed to the muslimin. So it's something that we need to pay attention to. Uh, we're going to take a short break, uh, but we'll be right back. So please don't go away. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, we'll be right back with you. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Welcome back and if you have just joined us uh, you are watching Ramadan journey I'm Zafar Bangash and my guest of course is Imam Muhammad Al Asi uh, Imam Muhammad al Asi, before we took the break, uh, you were discussing uh, and elaborating on uh, who a mu'min is, and you had linked it with amana, trust, and aman, uh, which is uh, security. Uh, would you like to add anything further to this? Well, to add anything further, we'd have to, you know, uh, choose specific ayat in the Quran that have these words in them. Why don't we consider the one about Ramadan itself? For instance, it starts off with, "Ya ayyuha al-lazina amanu kutiba alaykum al-siyamu kama kutiba ala al-lazina min qablikum la allakum tattaqoon." Yeah, we can do that. Uh, and to do that, let us remind the those who are tuned in that Ramadan was. Um, uh, made a, a, a was designated a month of fasting when the committed Muslims were in Al Medina, not in Mecca. Right. It, remember now, this is very important to remember. Thirteen years, or fourteen years, the Muslims spent thirteen years of them in uh, Mecca, and then a year in Al Medina. And then they began to fast. Uh, so, as I as I said previously, you go from the state of being a Muslim, and then you begin to acquire these new responsibilities as you mature and you grow through the dynamics of life, which will turn out to be a form of struggle. These dynamics that the Muslims were living at that. Uh, initial generation and the time came when after 13 or 14 years Allah told them now is the time you begin to fast now there is uh, uh, I want to interrupt you I want you to continue with that I just want to interrupt you that when we study the Quran in uh, the Makkan surahs uh, there is no ayat or verse that addresses the Muslims as ya ayyuhal lazina amanu the only time they are addressed with that particular expression is in the, the surahs that were revealed in Medina. Which reinforce, I, I mean, I know what you're saying and I agree with it, but if you are really uh, researching the uh, history of all of this, you will come across some scholars who will say, you know, there are some ayat in, in Mecca that said, Ya Yuhal Ladina Amanu. But, you know, we don't want to get into the fine details and the fine points uh, that have to do with, yes, let's say, a fringe uh, amount or number of scholars who will try to make that point. But, you know, we're going back to the fact that Allah Jalla wa Ala says to uh, the committed Muslims 13 or 14 years onwards, 
يا ايها الذين امنوا اذا كتب يا عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون now i want to bring to the attention of those who are with us i want to bring to their attention the fact that the prophet of allah who is the most knowledgeable of people of how to teach islam how to inculcate Iman, how to move the process forward, of course, with Allah's guidance. Why wasn't he telling people who were just becoming Muslims, well, in order for you to be a bona fide Muslim, you're going to have to pray and you're going to have to fast. This is what we do nowadays. Any person in this world who may be considering becoming a Muslim, he approaches you and I as average Muslims and he says, oh, now how do I become a Muslim? Obviously, the first thing we say, okay, you, you state that you are a Muslim and that statement uh, is done by the article of faith, as it is called, ash-shahadatayn, ashadu an la ilaha illallah, ashadu anna Muhammad rasulullah Up until here, it's fine. But after that, the first step after that, because that's what the Prophet did. The first step after that, in our time, say, well, you're going to have to pray and fast. No, no, that's not what the Prophet said to these people who initially uh, uh, vocalized their commitment to Allah by these shahadatayn. It was years and years later that this took place. As salah itself was not a feature of the uh, initial Islamic society in Mecca. They did salah itself was done uh, a decade at least a decade after they said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. So obviously even that decade before the Salah was formally institutionalized, they still were Muslims. Yeah, they were Muslims, but they were not praying. <laughs> yes. They were Muslims, but they were not uh, fasting. Right. But how, why is it in today's world that in order for someone to become a thorough a complete, a good Muslim, a good, pious, the word that's used here, I, I avoid the use, to become that type of Muslim, they're going to have to, immediately after they say the Shahadatayn, they're going to have to make wudu and pray, and they're going to, once, once Ramadan comes around, whether it's a, a month from now, or 11 months from now, they're going to have to fast Ramadan. Is that what the Prophet did? The answer to that is no. So there's something going on here. We are not acting in the way the Prophet uh, did. We are not performing the way the Prophet performed. We are not communicating this scripture, this Qur'an to people around us the same way the Prophet did. Something's wrong with us, obviously. So are we going to stop doing this and therefore concentrate the meanings of the Qur'an on issues of social justice? And then as we do that, and the opposition sets in, and we grow into this responsibility of telling the... I'm not saying to people who are already praying and fasting, don't pray and fast, go back to a shahadatayn. No, this is something I think that uh, we ask Allah that He accept from us. But we should know that these people now who are becoming Muslims, or are interested in becoming Muslims, uh, let's uh, try to educate them, so to speak, or let's try to ha have them get involved the same way the Prophet got those first uh, Muslims uh, involved, in the same manner, in the same direct uh, direction, with the same obligations, not jump the gun, and then have them feel that, oh, now they're performing these rituals. Well, there's no other, really, there's nothing else nothing to be else concerned to about. Yeah. When you talk about, you know, social justice, and we talk about all of these issues, uh, these are, you know, uh, distant issues. Uh, I'm all right the way I am because I'm fasting and I'm praying. But obviously, uh, social justice or implementing social justice would involve struggle. Yeah. And it would involve facing opposition from uh, the powers that be. Right. And this would involve 
uh, you know, a, a commitment much higher than simply the rituals that we perform. That's right. And and so you know, there there is something much more to to being a Muslim than simply going through the rituals. Important as these are, and as you mentioned, I think it is important that our viewers pay attention to this. That you are not saying that. Uh, you don't perform your salat or don't fast. I mean, that's not what you have said. That's right. But I hope that nobody would misunderstand that. What I you are saying so that we move beyond that now. We don't get stuck over there. That there yeah. is something much more that is required. Or it doesn't consume us. Exactly. So this, these rituals are consuming us and we are crippled. We're not able to go on to focus on that central issue, which is institutionalized justice and social justice. Yeah. So obviously... Um, Socializing justice and institutionalizing justice would definitely require struggle. And we would like to turn to that aspect of struggle uh, in our next episode that, you know, that, that when we'll come to, because the, the early generation led by the Prophet ﷺ, they also faced, and uh, they did not uh, shrink from that responsibility. But I'm afraid today's Muslims don't want to go in that direction. <laughs> Well, I hope that uh, uh, you will uh, pay closer attention to what is being discussed and the higher level of commitment that is required of Muslims, that, that we as Muslims would um, pay attention to that. And of course, uh, to help us uh, guide along that direction, uh, all of these uh, issues have been uh, discussed um, in great detail in this wonderful uh, tafsir by Imam Muhammad al-Asi, the ascendant Quran, realigning man to the divine power culture. Six volumes are already available, seventh is on its way, and by the time it's completed, it's likely to span to 35 to 40 volumes. It's, uh, in fact, an encyclopedic uh, study of the Quran, and uh, would invite our viewers to please uh, get their copies and understand what exactly Allah's message is to us and how we apply it in today's world. Uh, I'm afraid that's all the time that we have for uh, this episode. Uh, we hope that you have found uh, this discussion useful and thought-provoking and challenging in many ways. And that's uh, exactly the idea that we want to uh, challenge and engage your minds in serious discussion. Uh, so that we can move beyond the ritualistic aspects of our understanding and beyond the rituals that we perform, as we must, they are necessary but not sufficient. So we hope that uh, you have found all of this discussion thought-provoking. Uh, that's all the time we have for this episode of Ramadan Journey. I'm Zafar Bangash. Thank you, and wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh, that is for zakah to cure our greed when we give our money to those in need. That is for salamun alaykum. Peace be with you, wa alaykum salam. is for shams, the shining sun, which Allah placed for everyone. And so is for salah, for when we pray, facing Him every day, facing Him till we meet our Lord.